and welcome to South Bristol Amateur Radio Club's virtual club meeting. Uh, I'm conscious that we're joined by a number of people from outside the club. You're very welcome and I'm pleased to see you here this evening. Uh, for, for those who don't know me, my name is Andy. My call sign is G7KNA and I am the secretary at South Bristol Amateur Radio Club. I'm also the district rep for the RSGB covering Avon and Somerset, or what used to be Avon and Somerset. So if you want to get in touch about uh, RSGB matters, please feel free to email me on the email address you'll find under the Region 11 team on the RSGB website. So this evening we're very pleased to have a talk uh, uh, presented to us by Sean, G8VPG, uh, aimed at newcomers to amateur television, or ATV. Sean has been experimenting and operating ATV for over 30 years now uh, and it's safe to say that in that time there have been a number of changes uh, not least of which is the switch from analog to digital broadcasting modes. Tonight Sean is going to concentrate on newcomers to the hobby or newcomers to the area of ATV, uh, people who may not have used it for a long time or considered it before. Uh, and he has uh, two presentations based around simple practical projects aimed at getting you into the hobby. Uh, we will be receiving uh, a signal from the local TV repeater uh, and using some, uh, some modules from eBay uh, to create a microwave TV transmitter. These are all low cost and quite straightforward projects uh, that can be readily assembled from uh, commercially available bits of kit. So they are uh, quite straightforward, they don't require any specialist knowledge uh, and they are quite a lot of fun. Uh, there will be two presentations effectively, one for the, uh, the uh, receiving and one for the transmitting section and at the end of each we will do a Q&A session. Uh, so if you can make a note of any questions you want to ask, please save them until the end. Over Zoom it's a bit tricky to manage people uh, uh, trying to join in with a, with a presentation that's ongoing on screen. Uh, so if you can make a note of your questions please, we will take those at the end of each talk uh, and there will be some general discussion time at the end of the two presentations. Where I'm sure Sean will elaborate on a few points or indeed talk about a few areas that we haven't perhaps covered this evening. So with that, Sean, it's all yours. Uh, right, well, very good evening um, to everybody. Um, as uh, Andy has said, my name is Sean uh, G8VPG. I'm located in Saltford, uh, which is uh, roughly halfway between Bristol and Bath um, on the A4. And um, my, my chief interest in amateur radio um, is amateur television. And uh, I've been uh, dabbling in this for most of the time that I've been licensed, which is 40 years now. What I'm going to do this evening is um, going to give you a, an introduction um, to television based on a couple of projects, uh, which uh, are, are relatively inexpensive to do and relatively straightforward, um, which will give you a taste of, of, of what you can do with amateur television um, at, a, at a fairly minimal cost. Um, there's a, a lot of things that um, you, you can do, um, which um, as you get into the hobby, particularly when, when you start to get into transmission, um, it, it gets a little bit more complicated then because, um, as Andy was saying, um, we've tended to move over to digital modulation now, which hasn't made a lot of difference on receive, but has made transmission um, a, a little bit more complicated, but um, has made um, uh, the results we get um, better in actual fact because um, one of the things we've been able to do with digital transmission is to make big reductions in the bandwidth of the signal, which means that the, for a given power, the signal will go further or um, um, for, for uh, 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 your DX for, uh, will improve. So um, that, is, that has worked really well, but it, it, we're not going to talk about that this evening. Um, I'm going to talk about two projects um, which um, can get you started um, on, a, on a relatively simple basis. Uh, the first one is receiving the local repeater 
And the second one is a simple amateur television transceiver using drone video modules from eBay. And we'll start with receiving the local repeater. Um, now, in the Bristol area, we're fortunate, in fact, that we've got two repeaters um, in, in, in the area. Uh, the first one is GB3ZZ, uh, which is in Filton, Bristol. And it is located um, very close to the roundabout at the junction of the A38 and the A4174 and where Southmead Road uh, meets the A38 and the, the British Aerospace building is. So um, if, if you know that general area, the, the repeater is, is very close um, to that roundabout. So that is a, a good aiming point if you're directing an aerial towards it. Um, the other repeater is GB3UT, which is um, in Bath and is located on top of Bath University, which is an absolutely superb location, um, a, a lot higher than ZZ. Um, but unfortunately, uh, they've had some engineering problems with, with UT. Um, and because it's actually on the roof of a tall building, um, it's been almost impossible um, for the repeater keepers to actually get up there and, and maintain the repeater. Um, so it's not working as well as it, it used to. Um, and also, um, it is still actually an analog repeater. Um, so it's still transmitting wideband FM video, although it does have a digital input on 23 centimeters. So a lot of what I'm saying um, could apply to GB3UT, um, except that you would use an analog television uh, a satellite receiver rather than a digital one. And of course, um, since there are no analog satellite transmissions in Europe now, getting the appropriate receiver, unless you happen to hoard a few like I have, is a bit difficult. So let's think about GB3ZZ in Bristol. The output frequency is on the 23 centimeter band, which is um, 1316 megahertz. And television repeaters, um, most of them, and certainly the, uh, the two in our area, uh, ZZ in Bristol and UT in Bath, transmit a continuous test card or a series of slides. Um, now, not all repeaters do this. Um, some of them, um, only um, go into beacon mode for a, a short period of time every day or when they're actually accessed. Um, uh, this is usually done um, for reasons of economy uh, because uh, you have to obviously pay the electricity to keep the thing transmitting continuously. And it, it does mount up. And um, at ZZ, we use about four and a half units of electricity a day at running the repeater. But certainly in this area, um, you effectively got a TV beacon there on 23 centimetres 24-7. Um, ZZ is a digital signal um, and it transmits a two-channel multiplex, um, channel one and channel two. Uh, channel one will transmit the through video, that is the signal that a user might be sending through the repeater. And channel two um, sends um, a, a, some engineering information and also some housekeeping information. Um, for example, there is a camera on the gate to the uh, site where ZZ is located and that will pop up um, on channel two. And um, you'll see uh, a screen with, with three uh, temperature gauges on which we use to monitor the temperature of the repeater and there are also um, some receivers which monitor the input channels so that people can gauge the strength of their input signal. So all of that information is on channel two. The modulation we use is DVB-S, which is the satellite type of digital modulation. Um, as opposed to DVB-T, which is what terrestrial television um, uses. Um, the reason for this is that um, DVB-T is very demanding in terms of 
linearity of uh, power amplifiers and also the the support for narrow band um, transmissions is is not as good as dvbs um, it's, with dvbs essentially the bandwidth of your transmission is proportional to the the data rate or the symbol rate which you put into it so it's very easy to generate a narrow band signal uh, with dvbs GB3ZZ transmits MPEG-2 codec, which is one of the standard codecs which any satellite receiver will receive. And it transmits with a symbol rate of 4,000 kilosymbols per second or four megasymbols per second, which means that the, the transmitted bandwidth is, is around about five megahertz, which is probably wider than it needs to be these days. And um, a, a lot of us, when we're, we're, we're transmitting simplex, um, will use um, quite a lot um, lower symbol rate than that. And the polarization is horizontal. Um, and it, it, most 23 centimeter repeaters use horizontal polarization. So what do you need to um, actually receive the repeater? Um, you need a standard free-to-air satellite uh, set-top box. Um, and there are loads of these available. Um, typically, you can buy one on eBay for about £20. Um, the, a lot of people say, oh, can I use my sky box? Um, and I'm afraid the answer is no, um, because a skybox has a minimum symbol rate of about 17 mega symbols because it's really designed for, for wide bandwidth um, satellite um, bouquets. Um, so it, it won't be suitable for, for the narrow bandwidths which um, amateur TV um, uses. Um, I would also avoid free sat boxes um, because although some of them allow you to add non free sat channels, um, most of them make it very difficult. Um, and I've always found a lot of trouble um, adding non free sat channels to free sat boxes. So the best option to go for um, is a uh, a sort of bog standard, what we call a free to air set top box, um, which um, has got no sort of encrypting or decrypting in it. Um, as I said, you can buy them new on eBay for 20 pounds upwards. Um, very often, I think if you go to car boot sales, you can pick them up for a few pounds there. Another alternative is one of these all in one receivers. Um, this one is called the Saplink. And you can see these on eBay and also on Amazon. And these are complete satellite receivers in a box. So you've got a small four inch, three or four inch color screen there. Um, and it is a complete satellite receiver in one box. Um, and they are sold um, really for people who are setting up dishes. Um, I wouldn't say they're quite up to a, like a professional dish installer's um, satellite meter, but they are incredibly useful if you do fiddle around with, with, with satellite TV um, for, for setting up um, dishes. Um, this, is, this is one of the older ones. Um, the latest ones um, are a gold color, actually. And um, they um, do... HD video um, as well as standard uh, uh, definition video mm -hmm. and they've also got um, a wider frequency range than advertised and they will tune 70 centimeters directly um, which they don't advertise but they will do which is quite useful and these are about 50 pounds uh, one of these so to set up um, the receiver, um, the first thing you need to do is to select the, the standard universal LMB. Um, this may be the default um, uh, setting on the satellite receiver, um, but it's usually called something like universal LMB. And it's got two local oscillator frequencies, um, 9750 or 10,600 megahertz. 
So um, set it up with that LMB and you then need to add a transponder at 11066 megahertz, um, which is 9750 plus 1316, the output frequency of the, um, of, of the repeater. Uh, because the satellite receivers um, tuned the 23 centimeter band directly. So they've got a tuning range of, of 950 to 2150 megahertz um, um, as the standard. Some of them have got extended frequency range, as I said now, but um, in order to get it to receive on 1316, we have to add the 9750 local oscillator to it. So you set up a new transponder on 11066 megahertz. Polarity doesn't matter um, because that only uh, would be uh, relevant if you were using a, a satellite LMB. You set the symbol rate to 4000 um, and then you save that. Um, and if you've got an aerial connected and it's pointing at the repeater, um, you should start to get some signal strength and signal quality indication. Um, and you can uh, move the aerial to optimize that. And then you, you set um, the receiver to scan the transponder. Um, it's usually called something like scan TP. And um, if it's seeing the signal, it will come up and say, um, channels found, um, and it should find GB3ZZ channel one and channel two, and it will give you the option to save them. And once you've done that, um, you've got those two channels saved in your satellite receiver then. Now you're obviously gonna need some sort of aerial. Um, and um, this, is, this is the aerial I use actually, which is um, a, a German Yagi um, made by Wimmo. Um, this is a 28 element Yagi um, and they are very good, um, but they're over a hundred, about a hundred pounds, I think. So um, maybe it's it's not something you you, you might want to buy um, as a, a as a first when you're just sort of experimenting and, and, and playing around with this. Um, but um, these are good good aerials, the Wimo, um, but very well made. An option, another option, um, is something like this flat plate um, aerial. Um, this is another Wimo one, which you can buy brand new from Wimo, but you can get these at rallies. Um, and you often see these for the Wi-Fi bands for 2.4 and 5.6 gigahertz, but I've actually found them covering 23 centimeters as well, because I think in some countries, um, people actually use this 23 centimeter band um, for video camera links and this sort of thing. So I picked up one of these flat plate aerials at a rally for about 20, 25 pounds actually. So um, when the rallies restart, um, this is one alternative. Um, the other alternative is to actually make something. And um, very often what's in these flat plate aerials is can be something like this, which is called a bi-quad or a figure of eight um, aerial. And what this actually is, is two full wave loops um, for 23 centimeters, um, which are connected in parallel. And then there's a, a, a reflector plate behind it, um, which in this case is a bit of circuit board, um, but it could be a sheet of aluminium or it could be um, a, a mesh, um, just an open mesh. And these are, are, are really quite easy aerials to build. Um, and they work very well, actually. I've made a number of these um, and um, they're not too critical to build. They've got quite wide bandwidth and they will give you eight to 10 dBs of gain. Um, so it, it, it's not an easy, uh, a difficult thing to build. Um, and as you can see, um, really all we're talking about is a bit of coaxial cable bit of copper wire, a bit of circuit board. Um, so it can be made for, for, for next to nothing. And, you know, the instructions are on, on the internet if you Google 23 centimeter by quad. Um, sometimes you may need a bit of extra gain um, 
because the satellite receivers are designed to operate with an LMB, uh, which actually sits at the focal point of the satellite dish. Um, and an LMB has got about 60 dBs of gain in it. Um, therefore, satellite receivers are, are not always that sensitive by themselves. Um, depending on how close you are, um, you may not need one, but uh, a very inexpensive um, way of, of getting a preamp is one of these RF amplifier boards that you can buy from eBay. Um, now, I don't, there's a rather low resolution picture actually, but um, if any, I don't know, some of you may not do a lot of home construction, but um, if you go on eBay these days, you can get loads of little modules like this, um, which are all made in China. Um, although you can usually get them from UK suppliers. And if you want to make um, like a little pre-amplifier or um, uh, a, a small low power amplifier, or you need some attenuators, or you need a timer module or a relay module or a microphone pre-amplifier or a small audio amplifier, you can buy a little board like this ready-made for a few pounds um, and you know, put it in with other modules and, and you, you just cannot, you couldn't buy the parts to make this for what they sell um, them ready-made. And these little amplifiers are about seven pounds. Um, they're a wideband amplifier that will give sort of 20 plus dBs from almost DC to about four gigs. Um, and I've used quite a lot of these for various things and they're really, very good and it, it as i said it, it's just not worth making things for the price you can buy these little things for now so i mean it's not the lowest noise preamplifier around but it will give you a substantial uplift on the standard satellite receiver um, for a very reasonable cost and, and the purpose of this little project really is just to get you started at a minimal cost and, and hopefully it will whet your appetite and um, you can move on to other things then. Cable, um, use standard satellite cable. Um, it's very cheap and readily available um, and it, it, it's made to work up to over two gigahertz. Um, so it's quite low loss actually and, and I use it for all sorts of receiving aerials. It is 75 ohm but I mean the 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 difference in, in it makes very little difference really um, and obviously it, it's not intended for transmission purposes I mean you could probably get away with you know a few hundred milliwatts but you wouldn't want to put <laughs> um, serious power up it you'd probably melt it um, but um, for, for reception or perhaps for very low um, driver level links satellite cable works very well the other thing you need to do um, is to use a DC blocker uh, which is what this picture is here, because a satellite receiver puts out a DC voltage on its aerial input socket um, of either 13 or 18 volts. And, and this is to power the LMB. But most aerials, if you connect them directly to that, will short that out. Um, and some receivers give you the option to disconnect this DC um, output. But I'm a bit wary about this because I've had satellite receivers on the bench here, which you, you can set in software in the menus to uh, disconnect the DC feed, uh, but it doesn't actually work. It's still feeding DC out. And um, although they've usually got a resettable fuse in them, um, you can damage them um, by shorting out the, the, the aerial socket. So you can buy these little DC blockers um, for about three pounds on eBay. And, and all it is is just a, a, a capacitor in, in, in a little screen box like this. And this will block the DC voltage um, and, and stop that problem from happening. So once you've done all this, um, this is what you'll see for channel one. Um, this is um, one of the, the slides which GB3ZZ transmits is Clifton Suspension Bridge. Um, the, the idea of this talk is really to encourage you to do it, try this RF wise, but you can actually monitor this 
on the stream, um, on the BATC um, live stream um, and, and watch this because we stream it, the, the repeater to the internet 24 um, seven. So you can get a taste of what you're gonna see RF wise um, on the net. Um, so that's channel one. This is channel two. Um, and this is showing one of the satellite receiver um, information screens which enables people to gauge their signal strength when they're accessing the repeater. And again, this is streamed on a separate website, on Cam Secure's website, and you can watch it there and you can select which of the um, screens to actually watch um, from uh, channel two. Um, I should have said that ZZ um, has got two inputs. It's got an input on 1249 megahertz, but it's also got a 437 megahertz input. Um, and we are shortly, um, hopefully, um, maybe by the end of the year or early next year, doing a major upgrade to the receivers on ZZ so that they will be able to receive multiple symbol rates. Um, and we think that's going to make a big difference to the distance that people can actually work the repeater um, at. So further information, um, if you're interested in amateur television, it's well worth joining the BATC, uh, British Amateur Television Club. Um, this is um, the sort of amateur TV is equivalent to the RSGB. Um, there's about 1400 members now. Um, membership is eight pounds per, per year. And, and you get a quarterly magazine that's sent to you by email as a PDF. Um, you can pay 20 pounds a year and have it print a printed copy, but for eight pounds a year, um, you, you get the thing by um, PDF. And there's a huge amount of information on the BATC website. They've got their own wiki um, with lots of information. Um, they've got their own forum um, with loads and loads of, of, of uh, information there and the ability to for you um, to ask a question. And it's monitored by uh, all the leading ATVers. And I find if I've got a problem and I pop up a question, I invariably get an answer, you know, within a day or so. So lots of information from the BATC. So that is the end of the first simple project, how to receive your local repeater. So if people have got questions, I'd be happy to sort of take them now um, before we move on to the, the second part. Um, so I'm not certain, probably um, controller has got to uh, unmute people or something and... Uh, I, I had a question, if that's Rob okay. Yes, Robin, go ahead. Uh, oh, sorry, sorry. Sorry, David. Yeah, M0TFY. Sorry, you sounded a bit like I'm squinting. <laughs> yeah. So um, is he a Kiwi as well? That's a problem. No. So the, the question is, you showed the um, little wideband amplifier. Yes. Um, they normally, you no, normally use those with a bias T. So can you use the voltage from the receiver to power that and then go to the DC blocker to the antenna? Um, not without a bit of modification, no. Um, that amplifier actually showed they operate at five volts. Okay. And the voltage coming out of the receiver is either 13 or 18, depending on what polarity you've selected. Um, uh, because the way the LMB switches polarity is by changing the voltage from 13 to 18. Okay, understood. Um, but if you were if you wanted to, you 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 could add a little choke in in in, in there to to um, and as you say, use a bias T to send the voltage up up the, up the coax. Uh, but you 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 unless you found a preamp that worked on twelve volts, um, then you would have to do a little bit of work to that. Um, and most of the cheap ones tend to operate on fairly low voltage, actually. Um, so um, most of these mimics actually operate the five volts or even lower um, and, and they need a voltage regulator to, to reduce down to, to five volts. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, be silence there then, Sean. Yes, okay, okay. Well, let's... Um, 
let's move on to the next talk then. Um, Right. Um, if you ask people um, which band do you think would be the simplest and easiest to make a start on actually transmitting amateur television, um, most people probably wouldn't think it was a microwave band. But in fact, um, the simplest and cheapest way to actually start transmitting amateur television is on the 5.6 gigahertz or six centimeter band. Now, uh, radio amateurs have always been uh, good at adapting commercial equipment um, for, for, for their own use. And uh, I mean, the classic example of this was, you know, all the war surplus stuff, um, in the 1950s and 60s, which you know lots of amateurs used and adapted, and you know they got equipment that cost a fortune to make um, to sort of professional military standards um, for very little money, and uh, certainly as a, before my time, but you know in the 50s and 60s, lots of amateurs were using this sort of equipment um, in their own stations, and the same sort of thing happens today. Now, this is a drone, um, which um, no doubt many of you uh, will, will have learned about. And most of these drones have got a little camera on them. And this camera transmits its output back to the person flying the zone, uh, the, the drone. Um, and this is called FPV, I think it's first person view. Um, and it turns out that um, most of these systems operate on 5.6 gigahertz. So uh, about two or three years ago, um, a bunch of amateurs suddenly tumbled to uh, what was happening here. And the question was, um, could we use this um, for amateur television? So the six centimeter band um, is in the region 5650 to 5850 megahertz. And the a common drone frequency is 5665, um, which is the standard we've adopted. Um, and most of these drones can be set to operate on this frequency. Now, uh, they actually use old fashioned analog FM video modulation, wideband video modulation and uh, most of them have got stereo sound capabilities as well. So uh, this is uh, moving away from digital. In fact, it's the only sort of area where I, I use sort of analog video modulation these days. But um, this is the, the thing you can pick up off of eBay, which makes all this possible. This is a complete set of a transmitter and a receiver and all the necessary interconnecting cables. And you can buy this slot for about 40 pounds off of eBay. And what would happen um, with this if you were in a drone is that the smaller module here on, on the right hand side is the transmitter. And this will be connected to a, a very small aerial. And then this is the receiver, which you would have uh, back with the uh, radio control transmitter for, for controlling the zone. And this will be picking up the uh, output from, from the transmitter. And as I said, believe it or not, <coughs> you can pick this complete setup um, on eBay for about £40. Um, and you've got yourself here um, an amateur television transmission system that um, is surprisingly effective. And I'll, I'll show you the distance that you can work with this um, later in the, in the talk. So um, typically the frequency of these modules um, is set by a series of little dip switches. Um, and you get a chart something like this with them. And you've got to fiddle around with these little switches to select the frequency that you want to use. And the most important thing is that um, check that it 
they can be set to 5.665 gigahertz. That is the frequency that is in the amateur band and has been standardized for um, FM video transmission on, on six centimeter band. The transmitters um, usually have an output of about 600 milliwatts, um, but they become very hot if they're operated at full output. Um, the early trans, uh, modules um, had a fixed output, which was the full output power. And they have a, had a habit of burning out after two or three hours use. Um, the, the ones available now um, have usually got seven or eight different levels. And it's much better to set them back to um, a lower level where they operate um, at, a, at a much cooler temperature and to use a separate booster amplifier um, if you want to boost the power output up a bit. <coughs> and again, these mod amplifiers are available um, for, for um, 30, 40 pounds on eBay, although it's, it's not necessary. Um, um, I mean, a few hundred milliwatts is enough to get you some quite good results with these, these systems. So this is typically um, how a system for 5.6 gigahertz might look. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, down here, you've got your transmitter module. And essentially, you just plug a video camera, like a camcorder, into this, except standard video. And the output is uh, an FM modulated signal on uh, 5.6 gigahertz. This particular one has got a small power amplifier here, um, which is probably boosting that up to um, two or three watts. This is the receiver. Um, and um, the output of this would go to a small video monitor so that you can actually watch the picture. This is a changeover relay. Um, and this does need to be um, a high specification microwave relay. Um, however, um, you can pick these up at rallies for about 20 pounds. Um, and they tend to be um, very small relays with SMA type sockets on them. It's not strictly speaking necessary. I mean, you can change things over manually um, if you want to. Um, and a lot of people do that because when we're operating television, it, it tends not to be like phone where you say a few words and, and then you, you release the PTT and um, you listen and then you, you're constantly going backwards and forwards. With television, the person transmitting tends to sort of send five or 10 minutes of video and then he drops um, and the next person sends. So um, a means of, of of quickly changing over it is not essential. Um, and, you know, if, you, if you're dabbling with this um, at minimum expense, then it's something that can be um, dispensed with. Um, most of the cheap relays um, operate on 20, 28 volts. And so if you're using um, <coughs> 12 volts, um, you need a little eBay voltage converter module, um, which will, um, convert 12 volts up to 28 volts to operate the relay. But that is it really. That is all you need for a complete television transceiver for 5.6 gigahertz. It really is very simple. And, and, and essentially all this is already made for you. And really all you've got to do is connect it all together um, and, and, and operate it. This is the, one of the type of aerials. Um, um, 5.6 gigahertz is, is a Wi-Fi band, and therefore you will see lots of cheap aerials as Wi-Fi extender aerials. Um, you can get Yagi's. Um, this is like a grid dish. Um, so uh, this is the type of um, aerial that I use for this frequency. Um, another possibility is the flat plate um, type aerial, these, these flat plates. And, and these are quite common because, as I said, these are used as Wi-Fi extension aerials. And what this person has done here is, um, rather than have a changeover relay, 
they've used separate aerials for transmit and receive. Um, so they don't need to change every relay. They've just got a separate aerial, one for the transmitter, one for the receiver. Um, so uh, that's another way um, of, of perhaps doing it and avoiding the cost of a relay and, and, and the changeover um, circuitry. Uh, a third option is to use a, something like a, a small dish, like a, an old sky dish. And this is actually being fed by a printed circuit um, log um, periodic aerial, a wide band log periodic aerial. And, and you can buy these. Um, again, have a look on the internet, you'll see them. Um, and they make a very good feed for a dish. So, you know, a scrap sky dish, uh, a small um, printed circuit uh, feed. Um, and I mean, you know, the gain on these um, dishes is, is probably 20, 25 dBs, you know, so it's quite a potent little um, aerial there. What can you actually do? Um, well, uh, there's a number of things you could do with this. Um, perhaps if you, um, it might, being a microwave band, it tends to be line of sight. Um, so um, pot potentially, if you had someone locally, perhaps across the other side of the city, and you had a fairly good line of sight path, you could set up your own little video link between yourselves. Um, but a lot of the activity tends to take place portable. And this was yours truly um, on the Mendips about two years ago um, with, with my setup on 5.6 gigahertz. And we had a fantastic tropo opening. And if you look on the horizon there, you can see that gray band, which is a temperature inversion. Um, and um, we were there all day. And uh, in the morning, things weren't going very well. But in the afternoon, this sort of temperature inversion came up. Um, and this is what I managed to work on six centimeters, M0 DTS portable in North Yorkshire, 370 kilometers. And until recently, this was the world record for six centimeter TV. Uh, it's been beaten by about 10 or 20 kilometers by some Japanese amateurs now, uh, but it's still one of the longest QSOs um, for um, television on six centimeters. And my transmit power was about one watt. And uh, Rob at the other end was sending about five watts. Um, so that's his test card there. You can see IO94 um, was where he was located. And there he is in, in the back of his van. Um, and it, it really was a, an incredible day out, this was, um, with an incredible tropo opening. I don't think we've had an opening quite like it um, since. Um, and this was uh, portable on the Mendips. Um, here are the hazards of portable operation. Um, we, were, um, we were in the field next to Penhill Mast. Um, and, and the cows came to, to pay us a visit. Um, but I would say I would avoid this site now because I did try to use it um, recently. Um, and the farmer made very clear that he didn't like people um, using his field for amateur radio. So it's a lovely site, uh, but unfortunately you can't get, get permission to operate there um, now. But um, uh, this was almost exactly two years ago. So there we are. Um, further information um, is available on the BATC wiki. And there's a lot of information on how to build this system there. And the other thing I would say is this, that um, you may not be interested in, in television, but you may be interested in, in dabbling in microwaves. Now, you can use these modules for wideband FM phone operation. And all you do is, um, instead of putting video into the video input um, on the transmitter, you use a microphone and a little microphone amplifier board. And again, you can buy these little microphone amplifier boards on eBay for, for, for a few pounds. Um, and then um, you can use them um, for wideband FM phone operations. So, um, you know, they work extremely well. 
and um, a, a, about two years ago, well, it's going to be about three years ago now, um, Practical Wireless published a project on, on all the detail of how to actually do this, how to use drone modules as wideband FM phone. So uh, besides being the easiest band um, to set up on amateur television, it's probably the easiest microwave band to set up with phone operation as well. So um, if you're not interested in television and you want to dabble um, and, and sort of dip your toe in the water with microwaves, you can use this system for FM phone operation as well. So there we are. Um, that is... Um, the, the end of the talk, um, the end of both talks. So we'll end the show. And I think I'm back um, again, aren't I now? So uh, does anybody have any questions? I think someone needs to unmute, or you need to unmute yourselves, don't you? I think you've got to click on your mute there to, uh, to unmute yourself. So if anybody has any questions. Go on. Oh, go on. Somebody else go first. Yes, um, it's David, M M0TFY. Um, is there, are there repeaters on uh, that six centimeter band? And is there a way to go from analog to digital through something like a repeater or um, some sort of transverse or something like that? I'm not aware of a repeater with an output on that band, but I think one or two TV repeaters have got an input in that band. Um, as far as conversion standard, uh, standard conversion goes, um, I think, uh, well, for example, if, if, if you had a, um, a six centimeter input to a repeater, um, the receiver would produce, um, oh, let me just, I, my battery's going, let me just switch the power blades on. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry about this. I thought I'd switched it on actually, but uh, there we go. Um, um, most repeaters have got a digital output, so the six centimeter receiver would produce video, which would be applied to a digital tra transmitter or digital encoder. So it, it would sort of convert the standard that way, which is, which is the way you, you would do it. Um, there are a few people who um, have got 5.6 gigahertz linear transverters, uh, like the Kuhn electronics um, devices, um, which they use um, for narrow band sideband operation in the band. Now you can use those for tele digital television as well, um, because they're relatively wide band. Um, so, I mean, for example, I've got a 10 gigahertz system I built, which uses um, a Kuhner um, transverter um, and I can either um, put two meters sideband into it or I can put a two meter digital TV signal into it and, and it works very well. Thank you and sorry a second question. Yeah. Um, if, if drone owners are able to access those frequencies just by flicking a few dip switches do you find any interference from non-licensed people? Um, I personally haven't. I think some people have, um, but but I haven't. No, no. John. Yeah. Um, on that very topic, have those, is, there isn't a possibility. I would have thought that, um, uh, or basically interfering with a dr an operating drone, uh, the control thereof. Um. I don't believe they actually control the drones on 5.6 gigahertz. The, 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 the um, it, it wouldn't make sense because they would interfere with themselves. If, if they were using 5.6 gigahertz to control the drone whilst they were also transmitting video, they would interfere with themselves. Um, so I think the, I'm, I'm not familiar with radio control models. Um, I, I was speaking to someone recently on a site, um, and I think they actually use 2.4 gigahertz now, um, which of course we use as the video uplink to the satellite. Um, 
but I think there's also, isn't there some 70 centimetre frequencies for radio control as well now? Um, I, as I said, I'm not really familiar with that. So, but um, I, I don't think it's a problem um, that we would have by using 5.6 gigahertz. I, I mean, you, you, it might affect Wi-Fi, mind you, but. <laughs> <laughs> yes, okay, yeah, good point, actually, yes. I don't, I haven't kept up to date with uh, radio control frequencies, so um, yeah, I don't know, but yeah, thanks. Very good talk, by the way. Thank you. I mean, in the, in the old days, it used to be 27 megahertz, didn't it? And then I think it moved to 35 megahertz. And since then, I've completely lost touch with it. But I, I was up on I was up on top of Lansdowne, actually, um, looking around for somewhere to operate um, back in the summer. And there was a man flying model aircraft there. So I went over and had a chat to him. And it turned out that the the Bath Model Flying Club have got an agreement to use one of the playing fields at Lansdowne on some days a week to fly model aircraft. Um, and I said, what frequency are you using? And he said, 2.4 gigahertz. And I said, I better not bring my satellite uplink system up then, had I? <laughs> 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 that, so um, th there we are, but uh, I, I don't know. Um, I don't know the, the the modern radio control frequencies. Good talk, I, I, by the way. Thank you. I, I'm pretty sure, Sean, you're right that um, uh, 2.4 gig is the normal control frequency for, for, for a lot of stuff now. It's gone into the Wi-Fi band, effectively. Right, right. Yeah. I, I, I'm surprised, actually, because there's a lot of potential for interference there, isn't there, really, with Wi-Fi and everything, but um, there we are. Any other questions? Oh, Sean. Hello, Sean. It's uh, Peter Smith, G1LTI. I you sold you the big dishes. Do you remember Luton? I hope you're yes. using them. I, I hope I, you're I, using I, them. It's downstairs, and, and uh, Peter there has sold me a, a lovely dish for 5.6 gigs. And, and one of my projects I haven't got around to yet is to move that transceiver onto the big dish. But um, I'll be getting around to it. <laughs> Peter, your question. Yes. Um, I, I wonder if you've had any experience of high definition. Um, you know, this is composite and the pictures via 5.6, six centimeters is stunning. It is absolutely amazing, yes. really. And a left and right channel, just amazing. But yeah. I wonder if you have any experience of uh, high definition. Yes. Um, I mean, this is not really beginners amateur television, um, but some of you may be aware um, that about 18, well, two years ago, in fact, now, um, a satellite, Quebec Oscar 100, was launched, which is a geostationary satellite. And this satellite has an amateur television transponder. And we can transmit amateur television um, via this geostationary satellite. And I've got a system here which um, I, I can use um, uh, for the... the uh, satellite. Now a lot of people have been using high definition TV modes um, via the satellite and yes it is possible using digital modulation techniques um, and codecs like H265 um, DVB-S2 modulation to send really quite good HD pictures um, in, in, a, in a quite a narrow bandwidth, um, you know, in half a megahertz or, or, or even less. Um, so it is possible, um, but it would, it, it would require quite a long talk to explain exactly how to okay. do it. Okay. Um, but if you look on the, um, the BATC wiki um, and website and look at the system called Portsdown, um, which is the BATC Digital Television Encoder Project based on a Raspberry Pi. Um, and, and that is, is one way to do it. Um, there are other ways as well. But as I said, I, I could be talking for a lot longer here if you got me started on that. <laughs> the idea of this evening was really just to give to simple projects um, that don't cost a lot and which, you know, 
someone or a group of people or a club could do um, to dip their toes into television and perhaps if they enjoy it, they can move on to other things. Any other questions? Sean, um, yes. omnidirectional antennas for receiving the six centimeter. Um, so, you know, a bit of SWR, you know, listening, um, so to speak. Omnidirectional, I suppose you would be looking at something like um, one of these slotted microwave, uh, slotted waveguide right. uh, areas, or possibly an Alford slot. Um, mm. I, I don't think I've seen it. I've, we've, obviously, we've got Alford slots on GB3ZZ at 23 centimetres. And those are only about 30, 35 millimetres diameter. So I would imagine the diameter at six centimetres is really going to be very small and quite critical. Um, when we had GB3XG, which was the 10 gigahertz repeater up at Dundry, we had slotted waveguides there. So that is probably going to be your best bet for an omnidirectional aerial for 5.6 gigahertz um, but I, I've, I've not made one or used one and I don't have any designs for one I'm afraid. Okay thank you. Okay. Mm. Any other questions? No? Doesn't sound like it Sean. Okay, well, we stretched that out for an hour, just about. So, uh... well, that, that, that's that, 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 that's good going. And I, I, I would like to say, uh, I'd like to say thank you very much uh, for, for coming in and doing this and uh, giving us the benefit of your, your your knowledge and experience. Normally, we'd give a round of applause to speakers at the club, but I'm not sure if that's going to work over Zoom. <laughs> oh, well. So I think you'll have to take the take the um, uh, the. Uh, well, there you go. Take, <laughs> uh, take, take the, the, thought, the thought for the deed, I think, in this case. But yeah. uh, it's, it's certainly an intriguing part of the hobby. Uh, and I know there were one or two people in the club who were quite interested in, in hearing, you know, what you had to say. So, so I'm, I'm very glad that we could have put that, we put that together. And I'm very pleased that we had such a number turn up tonight from outside the club as well. So uh, 